Hi everyone, am I audible to you? Any voice? Yes. Good morning. Yes. Hi. Good morning. So great. Let's begin today's session. So back in next trip is twenty two CI. And start observing breath. The natural flow of breath as it comes in and as it goes out. And just check your posture. Back next is straight. Chin is parallel to the ground. Entire body is flat. And specifically focusing on the last in the neck and shoulders. Leave them loose and gently come back to the chest. And once you feel ready, you can begin to deepen the breath, taking longer amounts of time to inhale and to exhale. Try to relax the mind completely with each and every breath. And we'll, do the, we'll begin the session by chanting Om Chitang, followed by Three Shanti. Exhale completely. And inhale for Om. Join both the palms together and front of the chest. And up both the palms together. Place them on the eyes. And very slowly while blinking and looking at the palms, open up the eyes. And back with a big, big smile. And I'm going to say to everyone. <coughs> So yesterday we were talking about 
the lifestyle of a yoga practitioner. So the last point that was left in tomorrow's conversation after that our topic will be completed is Vaivar or behavior. It down as a chat box. Behavior, Pravar, V, Y, A, V, A, H, A, R, A, Pravar. <coughs> or the behavior. So this is our last point of discussion on this topic. So how your behavior should be in general, how you should be how you should uh, exist basically is what is covered under the topic of behavior or behavior. So over here, when we talk of the behavior, how our action should be, uh, mostly Bhagavad Gita is discussed over here. Yamas and Niyamas are of course a part of the way in which we behave, the conduct that we cover. But when we're talking of behavior, we're also talking of how each and every action should be. And the quality of the action has been mentioned in uh, Bhagavad Gita or Gita, a famous text which is a part of Mahabharat. And over there, Krishnaji clearly mentioned how the action should be. And we have discussed this before also when we were understanding the definition of you. Uh, the action should be uh, perfect, yes, so there is perfection in that action. And how is that perfection attained? To 100% dedication to that action. So if I'm doing one thing, I'm doing that thing only. And nothing else at that point of time. So my mind is concentrated on the task that I am doing. And on a physical level, I am doing that thing. So complete focus is on that thing. Even science has proven that we are not multitaskers. It's just the brain's ability to shift from one task to the other. So multitasking is a very modern concept. And actually at that point of time, what happens is the brain isn't capable of focusing on two things at the same time. But the brain has the ability to shift from the, uh, shift the focus from one thing to the other. So when we think that we are multitasking, what essentially happens is the brain shifts the attention from the two three tasks that you're doing like between them it keeps shifting the focus and as a result of that you're not focused on uh, one task completely so there's a lot of scope of making mistake when you are doing multitasking so even the brain is not capable of doing that it is just the ability of the brain to jump which makes us believe that we, are, we can do multiple things at the same time. But it is actually even scientifically, like on a biological level, it is not possible for us to do many things at the same time. So whenever in your behavior, like whenever you are performing some action, so it's giving 100% dedication to that action. And at the same time, you are not attached to the results of the action. So if I'm doing something, then I'm not expecting anything in return and I'm just doing it because I have the responsibility of completing that thing, okay? So a sense of duty and responsibility should be high and not as a burden, 
but as an understanding that you have to contribute something and this is that something you are contributing and when you are doing that do it with a sense of detachment because attachment will only lead you to go in a state where you are suffering a lot because of that okay so for example let me take a very common example for this thing attachment and detachment so uh, suppose uh, you go to some ashram and you serve over there so over there because there is no expectation because uh, you know that you're going for service and uh, you are very well aware that okay this is happening this is happening you do your work in that manner you uh, function according to that system and most people who serve have shown a lot of sense of happiness why because over there they're not expecting any like uh, person to come up to them and like thank them because they understand it's their responsibility to serve when they are voluntarily going for that service and second of all they're not ever equating their service with the return that they are getting so they're not concerned about like if the salary will come at the end of the month or if they will get paid or not because when one enters into the practice of seva they are totally like surrendering themselves to whatever they are going to do and there is no expectation of return but same thing if it happens in the work environment where you are going to serve maybe like uh, we do extra hours of work sometimes so at that point of time whatever hours whatever time you are putting into that thing you expect something in return yeah so if i'm putting in extra hours when i'm working then i will expect that the employer will uh, you know give me more salary or give me uh, per hour wage according to that thing according to the extra hours that i have served and for those extra hours i'll also expect the rate to be higher because now i was uh, earlier i was expected to work for only 8 hours now i'm working 9 or 10 hours so for those 2 hours i will expect that if i'm putting in that amount of work at least it is equivalent or more than what i generally earn yes and if that money does not come in then that thing will begin to trouble me because when i am put in that setup where i am earning then i have this expectation attached consciously or subconsciously the attachment it comes within us that i should get how much i deserve yes this thought really comes up when you are working somewhere or when you are giving your services for a particular amount of money so determining your own value it's good but sometimes what happens it is that it keeps you uh, stuck in the suffering yes so suspending that attachment is very important and it will only come as you go deeper into your meditation once again it's i'm not saying that don't go and go out there and get your work but just be very careful how much you are attaching your own sense of self to the um, outcome or the income that you are getting out of that thing because we directly equate it with our own sense of self or our own value when we uh, come in the material world or when we uh, you know function in that world we think that if i'm getting paid less or if they are not valuing my work that means that you know through payment so i'm not getting paid as much that means that i'm not isn't quite the case whatever you add to anything that you do in life is totally up to you and no amount of money trust me can uh, ever uh, compensate you enough because whenever someone works they sacrifice their time with the family with their children with their loved ones to go and work so nobody can ever pay you enough to compensate for that time that you are putting into that thing so it's very important that we suspend the expectation the attachment so that it's easier for us only to exist in the world otherwise we'll just be suffering our mind will be totally engaged in all of those things like you know and it increases a lot of 
uh, suffering because there is so much attachment so just try to be aware of these things when you are going ahead like even like in your student life in your career all of these things tend to happen so just relax meditate and uh, everything that is supposed to be there for you just trust that it's going to be there for you okay so never uh, have this sense of lack within you that you won't get what you are looking for you will always find it yeah so <clears throat> any doubts in any of the things that i have discussed in the previous two classes we have covered like food we have covered all of these topics and uh, today we have finally completed uh, the uh, concept of uh, lifestyle of a yoga practitioner so any doubts so far in anything okay all good oh great so uh, let's start today's topic the main uh, now we are entering into the main main things that you will be studying in depth so first thing out of that is the patanjali yoga sutra yeah Get it done in the platform. Patan Tadu Sutra. Today, our topic of discussion is this text, this very famous text that I have mentioned a lot of times. So, the founder of the text is Maharishi Patanjali. Okay, so it's called Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Yoga Sutra. or you can call it patanjali yoga sutra but the author is patanjali it is not patanjali yoga sutra you will find this name in a lot of books in a lot of modern commentaries it is written patanjali yoga sutra but the name of the text is patanjali yoga sutra or patanjali yoga sutra okay so maharishi patanjali is the author okay i'm just ah, okay now it's easier my hand got tired <laughs> okay so he is the like we were discussing about the um uh, uh when we were discussing about the history of yoga we uh, talked of the classical period the classical period where everything was systematized so he is the person who systematized the entire um uh, uh the entire process of yoga and he is also called the father of the uh, father of classical yoga he is called the father of classical yoga and there are multiple stories that uh, go on about uh, patanjali ji so i'll be touching up on them so um, first thing that you need to know about the text is that it's like in the philosophy when i introduced philosophy to you guys i said sankhya and yoga come uh, together so one is practice one is theory so this is totally based on the sankhya philosophy so it uh, completely accepts a lot of things that sankhya philosophy has said but there are some changes once again when it comes to sankhya philosophy some concepts like the concept of like if you go into sankhya philosophy you will find that there are 25 elements but in yoga philosophy there are 26 elements because patanjali ji introduced the concept of god or ishwar so there are some minute differences between both the philosophies 
however they they are very much in sync so they directly accept certain things from each other they are not questioning those things they directly accept those things and then they go ahead and give some more addition okay so if you want to go ahead and read read about raj yoga it is one of the schools of yoga then patanjali yoga sutra is the one that you generally end up reading okay so raj yoga i will write this down are j a can you repeat what you just said uh which part did you miss is 30 seconds back actually okay i was just saying that there are a lot of things which have been stated in sankhya philosophy which are directly accepted by the yoga philosophy and same thing goes for uh, yoga philosophy like uh, certain things that are given in yoga philosophy are directly accepted by sankhya philosophy so they're not questioning any of it they're just adding their own like uh, i would say new flavor like when you moves ahead and tells you about what you can do how you can achieve the final goal then yoga is basically giving its own essence in that so that is where it differs but most of the things are uh, generally like accepted by both the schools so you'll find a lot of common things in both the schools okay so this is something that you will find like when you read the pairing so same goes for the other two, two pairings that i gave in the orthodox schools you will find a lot of commonalities in the schools that are paired together so this is like uh, based on the philosophy like the philosophy of raj yoga is generally like um, you can consult this text if you want to understand more about raj yoga so we'll have a separate class on raj yoga but um, uh, just for reference right now i'm mentioning i will tell you all about raj yoga what raj yoga says i will discuss that school of yoga separately but this is something you need to know that this is the school that is mostly uh, like um, telling you about then the final goal in this text is called kevalya so it spelled as um, k a i v a l y a kevalya this is the final goal so samadhi is not the final goal the uh, there are different stages in samadhi and the final stage of samadhi is called kevalya so the a uh, final uh, like point that you are looking for patanjali ji gave that point the name kevalya which is which comes from the root word keval okay k e v a l okay and keval means isolation wait sorry isolation so isolation why he used specifically this term is because this state one thing can only be achieved by you when you work on yourself so no guru can walk the path for you it's you who will have to go ahead adopt this path and walk on it a guru will Uh, help you will tell you the way will tell you the you know and this is the from here you have to turn right then from there you have to turn left because the guru has walked on that path but it is you who will achieve that goal ultimately so it's also a state which is achieved when you are alone when you are in isolation so a yogi after a particular point of time has to leave this world and go into isolation to complete his sadhana even lord buddha uh, he went into isolation before he attained uh, the final enlightenment uh, earlier he was meditating with a few of his friends and 
that is when he realized nothing was helping him he wasn't able to reach the final goal and then what happened was he left everything he understood that this was not going to help him and he went in isolation that is when he you know rediscovered vipassana and how he can liberate himself very minutely he observed everything and he reached the final goal so most yogis that you will read about uh, go into isolation and that is when they are able to attain the final goal that is why patanjali ji gave this term kevalya to the final point that you are looking for so let's understand the text also a little bit so there are total of 195 sutras okay so in a lot of books when you pick those books up you will see 196 sutras this is only because from the original text one sutra was broken down into two and that is why like separately the meaning was given as the interpretations went on then that was the form that was adopted and interpretation was given according to that but in the original text there are 195 sutras which has which has overall been divided into four chapters so there are total of four chapters they are called padas so this is how the overall text has been designed by patanjali ji so this is one of the shortest texts that you will read on you in just a matter of 195 sutras he completed the entire process for anybody who wants to start with the practice of raj yoga and how they are going to reach their final goal okay so he didn't talk of any other thing he directly uh gave you the meaning of your what is happening why you're not able to attain it and what you can do what will happen on the path and then what is the final goal so overall in these 195 sutra sutras he covered everything all of these things he had covered and sutra is coded language okay so that is why you will find a lot of interpretations on the sutras because uh it was given by him in a coded language and it uh, everyone has a different way of interpreting that thing so multiple interpretations and you will find a new meaning in each interpretation that you read uh, some will resonate more with you some will resonate less so it depends on you which one you want to pick up to uh, understand the sutras and uh, one more reason why uh, the name sutra has been used in this is because um uh, sutra means like uh, you know it's in a flow so uh, to understand the say 20th sutra you will have to uh, read the previous 19 to understand the flow in which he was speaking so they're all woven in a way he like spoke in such a way that each the next sutra was like the understanding of the next sutra is supported by all the previous sutras so um you will have to go through the entire text to understand it completely what he was trying to say because the information was given in such a manner so overall this is like the overall information you need to have about the text like as a person who is not currently uh studying the text separately but is like um, still in the field of yoga this is a general general information that you should know and then i'll come down to each and every chapter like what happens in each and every chapter so that you get a little more knowledge 
so before starting with that let me narrate a few stories that pertain to maharishi patanjali ji so uh uh earlier like in earlier times what happened was um uh the knowledge of ayurveda existed in the world okay and it was able to heal all the uh, physical ailments that were coming up uh, in human beings and you know ayurved is uh, holistic in itself it's the science of maintaining the health of the body and w- once again once you have a healthy body that is when you'll be able to uh, move ahead in your spiritual practices so uh eventually what human beings realized was that it's not just physical illness which is troubling us there are a lot of mental things emotional like um uh issues that we face and we need to find something which can cure all of this so uh a few of the rishis they went to lord vishnu who's a very famous god in hinduism so they went to lord vishnu and uh, they uh asked him for some knowledge uh which would uh, you know um cure human kind of all of these suffering so lord vishnu said okay i'm going to uh, send my um you know he uh, lord vishnu if you even google him you will see that he is dressing on a snake a snake which has a thousand faces so uh, his name is shesha so shesha adi shesha both names you will find so uh, he said that i'm going to send him down and uh, he is going to be the one who is going to uh, give you the knowledge so eventually uh, um, his snake came down in the form of maharishi patanjali ji and um, he was the one who gave the knowledge of you so one story goes on like this that in order to cure all the sufferings of human kind uh, vishnu ji sent his own uh, serpent his own like um, you know resting uh, the uh, spot where he rested you know his own cushion you can say kind of he sent him down because he knew that uh, shesha ji was capable of passing down transmitting that knowledge so he took the form of maharishi patanjali ji and came to this world there are a lot of other stories also that go on uh, about uh, patanjali ji coming in this world so one more story which is very famous is uh one time what happened was lord vishnu was um you know resting and he went into sleep so when he went into sleep he directly got connected to lord shiva and uh, uh lord shiva is a uh, you know uh, god who is known for his wonderful dance so nataraj we also call him nataraj so when uh, lord shiva like when vishnu ji went into sleep he saw uh, lord shiva performing the tandav the you know dance that he does and he was instantly like captured by that dance and he was instantly magnetically drawn to that uh, you know a dance and um, he went into a trance so sometimes what happens is we see something and we go into a trance so vishnu ji went into a trance and because he went into that trance his body became very heavy okay so uh, he was experiencing this energy which made his body very heavy it made him vibrate at a frequency that the body became heavy and it became so high, heavy that uh, shesha ji wasn't able to hold him he was just about to give up you know he was just like now i cannot take this weight it went on for a while and suddenly when vishnu ji woke up like he got disconnected from that uh, dance when he woke up suddenly uh, his de- body became back to normal it became light again so shesha ji asked him what had happened happened and why like what was it that uh, suddenly you know his body became so heavy and then suddenly became so light 
so vishnu ji uh, told him um, you know this is what was happening and i was experiencing his dance shiv ji's dance and uh, that is why my body became heavy and uh, from that point of time uh, shesha ji had a wish that he wanted to learn the art of dance so in order to learn the art of dance he had to come down on earth to actually start learning it and perfect that art so he wanted to be the one who would please his lord uh, lord vishnu and hence he wanted to learn how to uh, dance and uh, lord vishnu looked at him and he told him that you know in the future shiv ji will give you that blessing that you will take birth in the human form so until that point shesha ji what he did was and the serpent just sat and he meditated he prepared himself for you know coming down and you know being capable of coming to earth so he meditated to show his devotion also to lord shiva he was meditating so after a while what happened was he got that blessing okay and for a yogi it's very hard to come into this world because uh, the parents of the yogi play a very important role in getting the yogi to this world so the parents also have to be very capable of holding the yogi you know the energy of the yogi is very immense so the body needs to be prepared in that way so down here on earth there was a yogini and she was like almost like at that point where after a while she knew that uh, there was no way in which she could have a child and she really desired a child so that she could pass on all of her information to someone so to be able to pass on whatever she had learned she wanted someone to be there like from her own family to you know pass on that knowledge to other people so she was desperate for a child and um, as a last attempt uh, she took some water in her hand and closed her hand and uh, in our times like in earlier times even in hindu tradition we pray to the sun god so she closed the hands with the water inside it and she closed her eyes and she prayed to the sun god and um, uh, shesha ji was already looking for somebody who was capable of you know uh, Uh, giving birth to a yogi so uh, as she opened her hands like he found her like you know that she is capable of you know having him so the timing was perfect and as she opened her eyes she saw a snake in her hands a very small snake and uh, eventually that snake turned into a little boy and uh, she gave him the name patanjali because the term pat means to fall and anjali is the way in which her hands were placed you know anjali mudra uh, you will study this in your course also so uh, the way in which her hands were held at that point of time uh, was the anjali mudra so he was given the name patanjali yeah and he went on to pass uh, this entire information of yoga to the human kind uh i'll just narrate one last story <laughs> yeah after that we'll move to the chapters so one last story that goes on about the transmission of the knowledge is um when patanjali ji uh, came over here he had this desire that uh, he will uh, only transfer the knowledge if there are 1000 students that are present okay so uh, where he went he announced this thing so people understood that he was going to pass down a very important uh, something very important so they arranged 4000 people okay they were just say okay gather in this this place he is going to come and he is going to transmit the knowledge so everyone was very happy that okay finally this is happening he is going to give the knowledge uh he had one more condition he said that if i'm going to transmit this knowledge then i will uh, need you know like for you guys to sit on that side and in between 
me and you there's going to be a curtain okay and nobody is going to lift this curtain unless and until i finish the information that i'm giving so all of the disciples said okay all right so the transmission of the knowledge began he started reciting the yoga sutras and he wasn't actually reciting the yoga sutras he wasn't speaking anything in fact it was just the way the people felt that transmitted the knowledge so when the knowledge was being transmitted uh there was a certain feeling that they got which made them intuitively understand what he was trying to say so everyone started feeling very good and everyone became curious because he wasn't speaking anything but they felt something okay and because when the knowledge of yoga is given and it is given like by such a big yogi that is when you know the energy of the group also rises with the transmission of that knowledge so eventually what happened was everyone felt very light energetic and they were, became very very curious who is sitting on the other side of the curtain so uh, this is very common with us also if one person starts yawning everyone will start yawning in the room if one person feels a certain way and then all the other people around that person will start feeling that way so energy transfers really quickly so one person became curious everyone became curious eventually so what they did was like they went to that curtain and before like while all of this was happening there was a little boy who had to go to the washroom so he was just like uh, i cannot interrupt the guru the master so i'll just quietly go out and then i'll come back it won't take very long so uh, while he stepped out this entire thing was going on and they lifted the curtain okay so they had a lot of curiosity to see patanjali ji so they lifted the curtain and as soon as they lifted the curtain up everybody was burnt okay so all the 999 people were now gone okay and that is when after like a few minutes the little boy came back and as he stepped in he saw that everyone was like gone and patanjali ji was also very disappointed because he was transmitting such important knowledge but now everybody he was giving the knowledge to was gone so he had only one choice that little child but what happened was that uh, the child had not taken permission to move out to go out and you know um didn't take the guru's permission basically so uh eventually what happened was patanjali ji uh, gave him the entire knowledge because he understood that he had to pass down the knowledge okay but he also gave the student a curse he told the student that unless and until you are unable to pass down this knowledge to at least one capable student uh, you are not going to like get free so you are going to remain on this earth uh, until that point okay so with the blessing came the curse so he got all the knowledge of you and he eventually like um, he was living on a tree so like um, in hindi we call this rakshas yeah in english i think we will uh, call it a demon so he lived on the tree and when somebody crossed that tree uh, as people crossed that tree he used to ask them one question okay and when he asked them that question if they answered he would you know understand that they were capable of receiving that knowledge and he would give them that knowledge but in thousands of years not even one person passed who could answer the question whatever question he was asking so he was stuck over there on that tree and if nobody was able to if someone wasn't able to answer that question the uh, thing was that because of his nature he had to kill that person so thousands of years he was on that tree and so many people passed and none of them were able to answer the question that he was asking so he wasn't able to liberate himself okay so eventually patanjali ji saw this from above and he only came as a student down again to earth 
and when he came like as a student he the guru became the student the demon asked a question asked the question patanjali ji was able to answer it and uh, then he got all the knowledge like took all the knowledge from him and he wrote the text down at that point of time and that is how the yoga sutras like came into writing basically so this is how like the stories go you will find a lot of other stories also related to patanjali ji where he taught even his exact location is not known but there are a lot of guesses of the time period in which he existed how he came into existence what happened what didn't happen a lot of uh, interesting stories you guys can google these things you'll find many more stories many more interesting stories but these are a few that i generally tell in the classes because uh, these are pretty fun like to hear so let me come back on track yeah so four chapters let me give you the names of all the four, ch- four chapters today and tomorrow we will discuss um what each chapter has so the first chapter is called the samadhi path this has 51 sutras then we have the sadhana path this has 55 sutras and we have the vibhuti path which has 55 sutras then we have the kevalya path Thirty four sutras. Okay, so I'll spell all of these out. S A M A D H I. Samadhi path. First chapter. Second is Sadhana path. S A D H A N A. Sadhana. Yeah. Then we have the Vibhuti path. v i b h o o t i the bhuti path and then we have last chapter kevalya k a i v a l y a kevalya path okay so these are the four chapters tomorrow we will discuss what each chapter has what you can find in each chapter how he has systematically given the entire process of you tomorrow we will discuss touch up on all of these things so any doubts in whatever we have discussed today okay no no, no? okay great so let's talk about uh, the details tomorrow because today we won't be able to cover it so let's end today's session then okay the back and neck straight just gently close the eyes and start off breathing breath the natural flow of the breath allow all this information to seep in we'll chant om one time followed by three shanti exhale completely and then inhale for om
Just feel the vibration. Join both the palms together and front chest. And bow down. And remember anyone is sitting from the past 24 hours that we are grateful for. Say a mental thank you. And drop both the palms together. Face them over the eye. Very slowly while blinking and looking at the palms, open up your eyes. Come back with a smile. And namaste to everyone. I will see all of you for your pranayam class in the evening, two o'clock. And um, if you have any doubts, you can note them down. We will catch up on those tomorrow. Yeah. So see you all in the evening. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.